Welcome to London, the world's capital of surveillance. Even though the year isn't 1984, you may be forgiven for imagining Big Brother really is watching you. I can see one, two, six, seven, 14, 15, 18 cameras on this spot. Every bit of public realm is monitored all the time, so that every single street. But also, it's just because all the different companies, different landowners, have their own CCTV cameras, so every spot is watched by everybody. In the most monitored city in the world, there is one camera for every 14 people. But does this intense surveillance keep Londoners safe? I mean, in a way, these streets like, are kind of dangerous because they're covered in CCTV, but no one's watching. That's what's interesting about CCTV culture, is it takes away like, the drive for having initiatives like natural surveillance being built in. Photographer Henrietta Williams and cartographer George Gingell have mapped a ring of steel around London's financial district. Forged from automated bollards, security gates and surveillance cameras, Anyone who enters is registered electronically, and anything out of the ordinary triggers security protocols. Even seemingly innocuous things like video cameras. You have to use the other side not facing the, the building guy. You can, but, but you can, you can as long as you're here. You can, we can film whichever way we want. I'm not arguing with you, it's like I'm telling you what I told I'm only doing my job. The police can rely on the private security to jump in there before them. So it's like a faster response mm. unit for less money to the government and to the City of London. And in, in fact, in most cases, the streets along this block were, were given to the developers so that they could enact the policy of completely pedestrianising the street, but also installing the defence and surveillance against terrorist attack and against sort of petty loitering and film crews and things. The surveillance systems here aren't just simple cameras. Anyone who behaves unexpectedly triggers an alarm. Imperceptibly, humans can observe and evaluate behavior through these smart cameras without anyone noticing. If the camera detects an unusual event, the subject is marked. One of the world's leading scientists behind the development of smart cameras is Professor James Orwell of Kingston University. The systems his team are developing can detect suspicious activity even before a crime occurs. The way is to present large volumes of data over many months, possibly years, and so that enables the system to develop a statistical model of what is normal and maybe what is abnormal and so then there is automatic flagging of anything that is uh, considered abnormal. Professor Orwell has been monitoring the university car park with one of his new cameras. The system is learning normal patterns of behaviour. Who leaves, who arrives and how they act. We're able to uh, measure how long they are they spend in this area, and so we can flag if there is some suspicious behaviour. For example, if there is uh, somebody is loitering in this area. Loitering is not allowed in the car parks of Kingston University, but the system doesn't perfectly understand human behaviour. An individual only needs to linger momentarily before the system flags them is potentially undesirable. In locations where thousands of people pass in front of the cameras every day, it's even more difficult for the systems to determine what is normal behaviour and what isn't. Are these people simply on their way to work? Or does this group hide a terrorist? Either way, inaccurate identifications can have serious consequences as the case of French national David Marie demonstrates. In July 2005, the IT expert entered the Southwark Underground Station. As the security camera passed over him, he was flagged up as different, wearing a jacket despite the warm summer weather. 
and he does not immediately board the first train to arrive at the platform. David now knows firsthand that he is being constantly evaluated. They found my behavior suspicious because I was not looking at them when I, when I entered the station. I looked at the steps instead to wait for Inga. This was enough for David to warrant the full attention of the security cameras. I would prefer to avoid the cameras if I had to see them, but they, now it's impossible to avoid the cameras anyway. There are too many cameras in London. David Marie was arrested and searched. When nothing was found on his person, police raided his apartment. One diagram in particular suggested to the officials that they had apprehended a dangerous criminal. I had uh, done, you know, hiding uh, probably on the phone or doing something else. Uh, and uh, they were very interested in that. And they, they thought, uh, they asked whether this was a map of the tube station. Uh, so as is doodles, I mean, you can see anything you want in them. It's impossible to disprove what it is or what it isn't. It's just doodles. Only three weeks before the police were quizzing David Marie, about his suspicious drawing. London had experienced the most devastating terrorist attack in the city's history. 52 people lost their lives when four suicide bombers detonated explosives on public transport. Three of them were filmed ahead of the attack during a test run on the underground. But despite the thorough documentation of their preparations, there was still no way for their devastating crime to be prevented. Suspicion instead falls on David Marie, whose details are stored in a file for terror suspects. Eight years on, and the authorities still haven't removed him from the file. I cannot travel to the United States. And considering that uh, my arrest was in connection with terrorism, even though I was never charged, I basically have no chance of uh, getting a visa. Anyone suspected of crime in the UK quickly loses their right to privacy. The Face Watch unit of the London Police presents faces of suspects to the public using footage from security cameras posted on the internet. This is a gentleman of interest, and there's the image that appears there. We tick the authorised button here so it goes on the public website and to the app, and we tick here to say that we authorise it. We then press submit, and that image has now gone into the system and can be viewed by the public on the Facewatch site and on the Facewatch app. Mick Neville is head of image recognition at Scotland Yard. He feels this kind of crowdsourced policing via the internet represents a powerful new weapon in the fight against crime. Thousands of people have registered for the, the app and they're taking it on. I mean, in, in the United Kingdom, people are very much, uh, they, they quite accept the CCTV, they think the police do a good job with the CCTV, and they, what they, they're happy to identify uh, criminals. There's not so much a fear of surveillance, I don't think, in the United Kingdom as possibly on, on mainland Europe. Over the past decade, the UK has been constantly seeking new ways to combat the perceived threat of terrorism. With this military base two hours outside of London, the newest techniques are getting put through their paces. Mark Lawrence is one of the new breed of experts, offering instruction in the use of unmanned aerial vehicles, or drones. No official government sources will publicly talk about the effectiveness of this new technique. Only Mark Lawrence will speak with us. So what I'm planning to do now is hopefully track Patrick down either on his way there or his way back. And if I don't see him in this yard, I will fly to the horse track and see if we can pick him up there. The hunt takes place across three miles. Okay, so we've got Patrick, we've located him using the drone. So we're gonna to fly towards him now. Big Brother approaches unnoticed from the air. Neat. When the target is discovered, the UAV becomes a constant companion at a height of 120 metres. And, and what we're doing is using a GPS lock to do this. So if I double click here, we can just keep the subject in the centre of the screen, the screen. And also at the same time, the unit will follow him backwards. So let's fly this way. And there you go. So did it work? Yeah, we got you. 
Got you in the house and coming out as well. So that's why it's good for covert surveillance. Would it be possible that we in the future see drones flying over our heads? Maybe not directly over your head, but definitely the police are using these now. They're using them for surveillance work and not just sneaking around spying on people, as a lot of people seem to think. So sometimes to catch the bad things going on, you need to be a bit, I could I suppose you could call it sly, but just secretive about it. There are plans to fit the drones with improved cameras, incorporating face recognition technology. Quietly, public privacy is being exchanged for greater security. Michael Chandler is the head of Vanquish Security back in London. He's also keen to demonstrate some of his techniques, some of which are alarmingly effective. Hi, how's it going? So I know this. How did you get that? Well, basically what we've done was we remotely switched on the microphone in your phone and recorded at a predetermined time. And that recording then uploaded to our online platform. The phone was bugged whilst it was left unattended on a table during an interview with the police. Professor Orwell was also monitored. And so then there is automatic flagging of anything that is uh, considered abnormal. Okay, so here is the photograph taken in the police station, I believe. There's that one, and there's this one. Here are the calls. So obviously there's all your phone calls. Okay. Text messages, which has been only one. We have an overview of your location, which is, because it's an overview, it's only got your location for this afternoon. But in general, it's also got all the photographs that have been taken and also the, all the voice recordings that we've made. So you just uh, can see everything without my knowledge, actually? Basically, yeah. Okay. That's, that's exactly how it works. And not only that, um, you, there is absolutely no way for you to be able to find a device on your phone. It's totally hidden. Only we, could, only we would be able to find it. Okay, so this is the photographs that we found in your phone. Um, currently, I don't know what they are, but what I can do is have a look at the times they were taken and then cross reference it with not only the recordings we have, but also the location. We can show you that you were at a police station on Seymour Street. That goes through GPS. This is a GPS report coming from your device. And that's all legal? This is totally legal. Absolutely legal, yes. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> As this demonstration has revealed, it's becoming ever easier to covertly track individuals using modern technology. And it's happening far more often than we realize. According to ex-NSA analyst William Binney, American security agencies now have the technology to eavesdrop whenever they want. So they're storing it all. They're collecting it all and storing it. So they need a large storage facility. That's what that's all about. And the point is that they hope by storing it all now that sometime in the future they'll figure out how to go back into it and figure out what's important so they can retroactively analyze everything. That's why they need five zettabytes of storage at Utah to store it all. William worked for the US government for 32 years. He was responsible for electronic espionage. A decade ago, when the authorities began to bug US citizens, he left the service. The fight against terrorism seemed to change the rules of engagement overnight. I mean, there virtually is nothing in the network that they can't have a copy of. If they start targeting you, so, 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 so what? They're, they already have your data. I can't find out what they're doing with my data. But I know they have it, okay. So I make sure I write in there whatever I, whatever I have to say about them, I say that in there. So that when they collect it, they know what I'm thinking of them. So, you know. With specially developed software, the authorities can tap into our computers without us realizing. This is a promotional video from the manufacturer of FinSpy, a surveillance program designed for the police. It is widely used across Western Europe, and the principle is always the same. The authorities infect the victim's computer with malware, 
which they hide in a fake software update. The unsuspecting user clicks on OK, and the police can now observe everything as it happens on screen. The intruder gets passwords, emails, and can see stored data. Not everybody in here works for Finn Fisher, right? This is the largest hacker convention in Europe. And in fact, probably more people in here work against Finn Fisher. Thanks for that. And so to that end, we can make a choice about which, what we'd like to do. Once a year, hackers from around the world meet in Hamburg. The theme of this year's meeting is state surveillance. Keynote speaker Jacob Applebaum knows what it means to be persecuted. He is a close friend and supporter of Julian Assange. To be free from suspicion is one of the first freedoms that is important for being free in the rest of your life. When you are followed around, when you are being investigated because of the whim of someone, this is the beginning of the end of your freedom. Does the NSA routinely intercept American citizens' emails? No. Does the NSA intercept Americans' cell phone conversations? No. Google searches? No. Text messages? No. Amazon.com orders? No. Bank records? No. That was General Alexander. He's the most powerful person in the world, probably. Even more powerful than the President of the United States or any leader of any other country. That guy's a fucking liar, first of all. Because we know for a fact... <laughs> we know for a fact from Mark Klein that the NSA was, in fact, doing dragnet surveillance of all of those things. Well, I mean, I don't really use a mobile phone for anything except security research these days. Um, so I don't really use a mobile phone. I choose not to use Facebook because I really think it's more like Stasi book. We should not just use systems that make trade-offs we wouldn't agree with that are not democratically decided. The Icelandic capital of Reykjavik is the perfect location from which to investigate the technologies states can use to track their citizens. It was from here that WikiLeaks released this infamous video from the Iraq war. Those involved with the release of the video suddenly found themselves facing up to a powerful opponent. But Gita Johnstatir, who has worked for the media and for WikiLeaks, sent photos from the video to the international press. This activity transformed her into a national security target, and her right to digital privacy was repealed, even though there were no legal proceedings against her. Twitter was demanded to hang over, hand over my personal stuff uh, within three days without my knowledge, which means that uh, the, we actually do have a very bad example now for the government of the United States to go into people, you know, even parliamentarians uh, in other countries to, uh, to snoop into their personal matters. What's most remarkable about this story is that Birgitta Johnstatir is a member of the Icelandic parliament. Furthermore, Twitter was not the only source of private digital information to hand data over to the US security agencies. Like looking at what experts say in this field in the States, for example, they speculated is Facebook, Google, perhaps Skype or IP host. I don't know, uh, but the judges refuses to uh, acknowledge the request from our lawyers to unseal which companies it is. John Statir did nothing illegal when she released the video, but it was enough to warrant invasive snooping from the US security agencies. So it's me, my younger son, older son. Uh, some people that I got to know later, I used to work with. Three years ago, the Icelandic people took to the streets. The banking crisis had hit the small island nation hard. The Icelandic saucepan revolution ultimately forced a general election. But Gita Johnstatir was elected to the new parliament. But for the US government, 
she remained a target. Today, John Stuttier campaigns for digital rights and self-determination. She wants Iceland to become a safe haven for sensitive data. They want to put a stop to the prying eyes of the state. We actually went on a quest around the world to cherry pick all the best functioning laws in this regard. Emails, for example, would be protected in the same way as written correspondence. There is absolutely no country in the world that has actually properly addressed uh, the fact uh, how easily it is for governments and corporations to mine through our private data. We in Iceland are, are focusing on creating a standard and uh, setting an example and then it would be really ideal, and this is one of the thoughts behind the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, uh, be ideal if uh, we can, you know, with these new set of laws, create a haven in such a way that, you know, I would like to see it spread to other countries. International demand to store confidential data in Iceland has increased dramatically. But according to Smari McCarthy, there is also global uncertainty about this issue. He is director of the International Institute for the Media. Journalists and their sources have deep concerns about their data being adequately protected. Your data is just being shifted around and they turn computers off and they turn computers on and your data is wherever they think it's going to be cheapest. This is great if you're running a business, it is terrible if you own data and you don't know where it is. And you know, suddenly the cat photos that you uploaded are subject to Brazilian law. That's not something you signed up for. The police can shut down illegal sites, as was the case with this raid on the server room for online file sharing site, The Pirate Bay. The problem is with the legal information from other providers that may be lost in the process. To protect this data from any access, it needs to be in an unreachable place. In the future, that place could be in Iceland. The idea of Iceland as an inverse tax haven, uh, that is to say a place that uh, protects people's privacy and people's information uh, and free speech rights rather than protecting people against uh, the tax authorities, is a very nice one and, and you know, it's, uh, it's definitely something worth uh, striving towards. It'll all take time, so, you know, hopefully over a long enough time, every country will be a Switzerland of bits. But Birgitta Johns Dutier will continue to use Facebook, Twitter and Google, claiming she is a guinea pig in the monitored space. She says whoever spied on her feels they can do it with impunity and that her case should be a warning. And it is such a temptation to go into somebody's home without them ever being able to know about it. Uh, and then I'm referring to uh, my online home. For it is just as sacred as my offline home. This is where all my private stuff is. This is where all my personal letters are. This is where all my thoughts are and all my activity and movement can be traced. So, you know, hands off my home. A similar case of monitoring is currently unraveling in Berlin. Andre Holm is a noted sociologist who is teaching at the Humboldt University. For months, he was shadowed and monitored, suspected as the leader of a militant group that committed arson attacks in Berlin in 2007. Es war der Morgen vom 31. Juli, also ein Sommertag. It was the morning of the 31st of July, so a summer day. In the morning before seven. I woke up to a pounding on the front door. Then a mass of armed men fell on me. They then threw me to the ground. My hands fixed behind my back. You then get the impression that you are in a film because they behave as in one of the thrillers or action movies. 
mir war schon klar, dass es sowas I was already aware that there is such a thing as house searches and arrests directed also against left-wing activists. That was already going through my head, but I could not understand what they actually had to do with me directly. So it was an abstract fear that I had at that point. Andre Holm was arrested by a special detachment and brought to federal court in Karlsruhe. Only later did Holm learn that he had been systematically monitored. The federal investigators had been studying his academic essays and the widespread use of expressions such as gentrification and casualization had inflamed their suspicions. These were terms also used by the militant group that had claimed responsibility for the Berlin arson attacks. The investigating authorities had created a character grid to use in the investigation, which suggested suspects should have extraordinary political and historical knowledge and the scientific and analytical ability to execute the attacks. Following his arrest, the investigating judge ordered Holmes' detention. After 30 days in solitary confinement, the federal court ruled that there was no strong suspicion. For the first time since his arrest, Holm is free. And for the first time, he learns about the surveillance protocols surrounding him. The excerpts from the minutes reveal a detailed investigation into all aspects of Holm's life. You spend your whole life second-guessing yourself. How will the police officers who have been listening to you interpret what your actions or words mean? You are doing something completely harmless, but have already read in the files that anything can be interpreted as malignant. If I tie my shoes in the street, then I don't turn my back, so as not to give the impression that I am hiding something. Then phones of friends and acquaintances are intercepted. Video cameras are installed in front of the doorways. You turn into totally transparent people. The investigators monitored Holmes' social environment and couldn't find any evidence to incriminate him. But this only caused them to intensify their surveillance. According to their logic, Holm is an intellectual who is highly conspiratorial and expertly concealing his misdeeds. That they may be on the tail of an innocent person didn't seem to occur to his pursuers. We were completely monitored. Our personal emails have been read. They obviously found ways, even before the online search, to gain access to our computers. There is also a sense of political outrage in the country over the loss of freedom to choose what the main ingredients of domestic social values should be, because those personal freedoms are trampled in the course of these kinds of investigations. Finally, anyone who now searches Andre Holm on the internet will receive a huge number of results, in many articles linking him to terrorism. For the rest of his life, Andre Holm will be tainted by the phrase, terror suspect. People are more conscious of the need to protect their digital privacy than ever before. The call for digital self-defense is heard everywhere. Emails are sent encrypted, but many are choosing to do without social networks like Facebook and Twitter. In Vienna, this group meet once a week for a cipher party. They discuss how to make themselves invisible in the network. Was it the steel? What is the goal of the door and the people that operate it? Anonymity, that is, from web browsing, chat or other internet services to make it anonymous. Until now, encryption techniques have only been in the domain of the authorities and elite internet geeks. These people want to spread the word. 
I think we are more and more transparent. Even when I use a debit card or a credit card, I have the same feeling. I want to save data as much as possible and leave as little as possible behind. I think it's wiser. Cypher parties have formed spontaneously all over the planet. The interest of the population has risen in the course of more government control and more profiling by large companies such as Google, Facebook and others. And the interpretation and openness of this profile data is a major problem and a major threat. These groups have straightforward aspirations. No one should be able to read their social media posts unless they want them to. And nobody should be able to leaf through their photo albums without permission. They argue this is not just paranoia. Privacy is a basic human right, and it must also apply in the digital world. When you bear back with the internet, you bear back with Big Brother. So maybe it's a good idea, just like we understood with HIV and AIDS in the 80s, we have a personal responsibility to not infect our, our friends and lovers and neighbors. And when you use the internet without any crypto, without anonymity, without privacy, what you do is you present a transit of risk to your community and probably even to your country, certainly to yourself. Big Brother is watching you. With most people having a limited understanding of this world of cyber surveillance and how to protect themselves, are our most basic freedoms already being lost? <laughs>